The International Criminal Court is now in session. L'audience de la Cour pénale internationale est ouverte. Please be seated. Veuillez vous asseoir. This is the summary of the decision on sentence pursuant to Article 76 of the statute. The chamber, composed of Judge Adrian Fulford, Judge Elizabeth Odier Benito, and Judge Rene Blattman, delivered the judgment pursuant to Article 74 of the statute on the 14th of March 2012. It found Thomas Lubanga Dailo guilty as a co-perpetrator of the charges of conscripting and enlisting children under the age of 15 years into the UPC FPLC and using them to participate actively in hostilities in the Ituri region of the Democratic Republic of the Congo within the meaning of Articles 8 to E, 7, and 25.3a of the Rome Statute from early September 2002 to the 13th of August 2003. Having received written submissions on sentence from the parties and, part and participants, the sentencing hearing was held on the 13th of June 2012, during which the Chamber heard the evidence of defense witnesses 39 and 40. Thereafter, the prosecution, representatives of victims, and the defense made their oral submissions. Following these submissions, Mr. Lubanga made a statement to the Chamber. The evidence of the two additional witnesses and all the oral submissions are considered in the written decision where relevant. In considering the purposes of punishment at the ICC, the Chamber has taken into account the preamble of the Rome Statute, which provides that the most serious crimes of concern to the international community as a whole, must not go unpunished. Paragraph 4. Pursuant to Article 77.1 of the Statute and Rule 145.3 of the Rules, the Chamber may impose a sentence of imprisonment that does not exceed 30 years unless the extreme gravity of the crime and the individual circumstances of the convicted person warrant a term of life imprisonment. In addition, the Chamber may order a fine or the forfeiture of proceeds, property and assets derived directly or indirectly from the crime or both, pursuant to Article 77.2 of the Statute. Article 78 of the Statute and Rule 145 of the Rules govern the Chamber's determination of the sentence providing that the Chamber must take into account such factors as the gravity of the crime and the individual circumstances of the convicted person, as well as any mitigating and aggravating circumstances. Article 78.2 of the statute provides that with a sentence of imprisonment, the court must deduct the time, if any, spent in detention in accordance with an order of the court. Additionally, it may deduct any time otherwise spent in detention in connection with conduct underlying the crime. Rules 145 1A and B of the rules require that the sentence must reflect the culpability of the convicted person and the chamber needs to balance all the relevant factors, including any mitigating and aggravating factors and taking into account the circumstances of the convicted person and the crime. Additional factors and circumstances that are to be considered are listed in Rules 145, 1C and 2 
of the rules. Finally, pursuant to Article 81 2A of the statute, the Chamber must ensure that the sentence is in proportion to the crime. The legal framework applicable to the sentencing stage of the proceedings applying Article 21 1 of the statute is set out in Articles 23, 76, 77, 78, and 81 2A of the statute, and Rules 143, 145, and 146 of the rules. And it is to be noted that none of these provisions limit the factors that are properly to be considered during sentencing to those described in the confirmation decision. Instead, Article 76.1 of the statute establishes that when considering the appropriate sentence, the trial chamber shall take into account the evidence presented and submissions made during the trial that are relevant to the sentence. Pursuant to Article 76.2 of the statute, the chamber may, on its own motion, and it shall, at the request of the prosecutor or the accused, hold a further hearing to hear any additional evidence or submissions relevant to the sentence. In the judgment of the chamber, the evidence submitted at this stage can exceed the facts and circumstances set out in the confirmation decision, provided the defense has had a reasonable opportunity to address them. The defense has had a sufficient opportunity to challenge the evidence and the allegations relevant to the sentence as advanced during the trial. In addition, the Chamber has provided the defence an opportunity to respond to all the submissions and evidence that have been relied on for the purposes of sentence following Mr Lubanga's conviction, and the defence has been provided with adequate time and facilities, including the opportunity to identify and introduce evidence relevant to sentence. It is for the Chamber to establish the standard of proof for the purposes of sentencing, given the statute and the rules do not provide any guidance. Since any aggravating factors established by the Chamber may have a significant effect on the overall length of the sentence Mr Lubanga will serve, it is necessary that they are established to the criminal standard of proof, namely beyond a reasonable doubt. The Chamber accepts that the mitigating factors are not limited to the facts and circumstances described in the confirmation decision, particularly given Rule 145.2a, little 2 of the rules, refers to the convicted person's conduct after the act in this context. As to the standard of proof, the Chamber is of the view that the in dubio pro reo principle applies at the sentencing stage of the proceedings and any mitigating circumstances are to be established on a balance of probabilities. Any factors that are to be taken into account when assessing the gravity of the crime will not additionally be taken into account as aggravating circumstances and vice versa. The crimes of conscripting and enlisting children under the age of 15 and using them to participate actively in hostilities are undoubtedly very serious crimes that affect the international community as a whole. Additionally, as set out in the judgment, the crime of conscription is distinguished by the added element of compulsion. The crime of using children to participate actively in hostilities involves exposing them to real danger as potential targets. The vulnerability of children mean that they need to be afforded particular protection that does not apply to the general population as recognized in various international treaties. As the Chamber described in the judgment, the principal historical objective underlying the prohibition against the use of child soldiers is to protect children under the age of 15 from the risks that are associated with armed conflict, and particularly they are directed at securing their physical and psychological well-being. 
This includes not only protection from violence and fatal or non-fatal injuries during fighting, but also the potentially serious trauma that can accompany recruitment, including separating children from their families, interrupting or disrupting their schooling, and exposing them to an environment of violence and fear. Against this general background, the Chamber has considered the gravity of these crimes in the circumstances of this case. With regard inter alia to the extent of the damage caused, and in particular the harm caused to the victims and their families, the nature of the unlawful behavior, and the means employed to execute the crime, the, gr the degree of participation of the convicted person, the degree of intent, the circumstances of manner, time, and location, and the age, education, social, and economic condition of the convicted person. The Chamber has not reached conclusions to the criminal standard, namely beyond reasonable doubt, as to the precise number or proportion of the recruits who are under 15 years. The Chamber, in passing sentence, has reflected its earlier determination that the involvement of children was widespread. The Chamber determined that Mr. Lubanga agreed to and participated in a common plan to build an army for the purpose of establishing and maintaining political and military control over Ituri. The Chamber did not conclude that Mr. Lubanga meant to conscript and enlist boys and girls under the age of 15 into the UPC FPLC and to use them to participate actively in hostilities. Instead, the Chamber decided Mr. Lubanga was aware that in the ordinary course of events, this would occur. It was in this context that Mr. Lubanga was convicted as a co-perpetrator who made an essential contribution to the common plan. Mr. Lubanga is clearly an intelligent and well-educated individual who would have understood the seriousness of the crimes of which he has been found guilty. This marked level of awareness on his part is a relevant factor in determining the appropriate sentence. Although the Chamber found that a number of recruits were subjected to a range of punishments during training with the UPC FPLC, in the view of the majority, the evidence does not support a conclusion beyond reasonable doubt that the punishment of children below 15 years of age occurred in the ordinary course of the crimes for which Mr. Lubanga has been convicted. Furthermore, nothing suggests that Mr. Lubanga ordered or encouraged these punishments, that he was aware of them, or that they can otherwise be attributed to him in a way that reflects his culpability. Therefore, it has not been demonstrated that the individual punishments referred to by the Chamber were the responsibility of Mr. Lubanga and the Chamber has not taken this into account and as, as an aggravating factor in the determination of his sentence. The Chamber strongly deprecates the attitude of the former prosecutor in relation to the issue of sexual violence. He advanced extensive submissions as regards sexual violence in his opening and closing submissions at trial. And in his arguments on sentence, he contended that sexual violence is an aggravating factor that should be reflected by the chamber. However, not only did the former prosecutor fail to apply to include sexual violence or sexual slavery at any stage during these proceedings, including in the original charges, but he actively opposed taking this step during the trial when he submitted that it would cause unfairness to the accused if he was convicted on this basis. Notwithstanding this stance on his part throughout these proceedings, he suggested that sexual violence ought to be considered for the purposes of sentencing. The prosecution's failure to charge Mr. Lubanga with rape and other forms of sexual violence as sexual crimes within the jurisdiction of the court 
is not determinative of the question of whether that, of whether that activity is a relevant factor in the determination of the sentence. The Chamber is entitled to consider sexual violence under Rule 145 c of the Rules. First, as part of the harm suffered by the victims. Second, as regards the nature of the unlawful behavior. Third, in relation to the circumstances of the manner in which the crime was committed, and under Rule, four, rule 145, 2B4, as showing the crime was committed with particular cruelty. The Chamber is entitled to consider sexual violence in determining the sentence that is to be passed, notwithstanding the fact that it did not form part of the confirmation decision. Given the procedural safeguards, there will be no consequential unfairness if the Chamber decides that sexual violence is a relevant factor. However, that said, it remains necessary for the Chamber to be satisfied beyond reasonable doubt that first, child soldiers under 15 were subjected to sexual violence, and second, that this can be attributed to Mr. Lubanga in a manner that reflects his culpability pursuant to Rule 145 1A. On the basis of the totality of the evidence introduced during the trial on this issue, the majority is unable to conclude that sexual violence against the children who were recruited was sufficiently widespread to mean that it could be characterized as occurring in the ordinary course of the implementation of the common plan for which Mr. Lubanga is responsible. Moreover, nothing suggests that Mr. Lubanga ordered or encouraged sexual violence, that he was aware of it, or that it could otherwise be attributed to him in a way that reflects his culpability. Although the prosecutor was entitled to introduce evidence on this issue during the sentencing hearing, he failed to take this step or to refer to any relevant evidence that had been given during the trial. As a result, in the view of the majority, the link between Mr. Lubanga and sexual violence in the context of the charges has not been established beyond reasonable doubt. Therefore, this factor cannot properly form part of the assessment of his culpability for the purposes of sentence. As already indicated, the facts that are relevant for determining the gravity of the crime cannot additionally be taken into account as aggravating circumstances. Therefore, the age of the children does not both define the gravity of the crime and act as an aggravating factor. Accordingly, the age of the children does not constitute an aggravating factor as regards these offences. The prosecution contends that the evidence demonstrates that the female recruits were, subject, were subjected to sexual violence, rape, and conjugal sub subservience on the basis of their gender. In the judgment of the chamber, the court has not been provided with any evidence that Mr. Lubanga deliberately discriminated against women in committing these offenses in the sense suggested by the prosecution or the victims. Accordingly, motive involving discrimination, pursuant to Rule 145, 2B5, cannot constitute an aggravating factor. The Chamber accepts that Mr. Lubanga hoped that peace would return to Ituri once he had secured his objectives, but this is only of limited relevance given the persistent recruitment of child soldiers during the period covered by the charges. The critical factor is that in order to achieve his goals, he used children as part of the armed forces over which he had control, and the Chamber has set out in the judgment its conclusions as, their, as to their continued presence in the UPC FPLC, notwithstanding public statements to the contrary and the demobilization orders 
he issued. Whether or not Mr. Lubanga genuinely, genuinely feared attacks by others, his response should not have included using children as part of the armed wing of the UPC. The Chamber has, however, reflected certain factors involving Mr. Lubanga in the aftermath of the offences, along with his notable cooperation with the court, as set out hereafter. He was respectful and cooperative throughout the proceedings, notwithstanding some particularly onerous circumstances, which included, first, the prosecution gathered an extensive quantity of evidence under confidentiality agreements, Article 54.3e, leading to a failure to disclose exculpatory material, which in turn resulted in a stay of the proceedings and a provisional order to release Mr. Lubanga. Second, the prosecution repeatedly failed to comply with the Chamber's disclosure orders, leading to a second stay of the proceedings and a second provisional order releasing Mr. Lubanga. And third, the prosecution's use of a public interview given by, given by Ms. Beatrice Le Frappeur du Alain to make misleading and inaccurate statements to the press about the evidence in the case and Mr. Lubanga's personal conduct during the proceedings. The prosecution argues that in order to avoid inexplicable sentencing discrepancies, the sentencing policy of the court should presume a consistent baseline for sentences, which should not be adjusted on the basis that some crimes are, li are less serious than others. It is submitted that the appropriate baseline or starting point for all sentences should be set at approximately 80% of the statutory maximum and this should then be adjusted in accordance with Rule 145 to take into account any aggravating and mitigating circumstances and other factors relevant to the convicted person and the circumstances of the crimes. No established principle of law or relevant jurisprudence under Article 21 of the statute has been relied on in support of this suggested approach, which would bind the judges to a minimum starting point of 24 years in all cases. In the judgment of the chamber, the sentence passed by a trial chamber should always be proportionate to the crime, see Article 81 2A, and an automatic starting point, as proposed by the former prosecutor, that is the same for all offences, would tend to undermine that fundamental principle. A life sentence would be inappropriate in the instant case, given the requirement in Rule 145.3 that imposing this sentence is justified by the extreme gravity of the crime and the individual circumstances of the convicted person as evidenced by the existence of one or more aggravating circumstances. Given the Chamber has not found any aggravating factors in this case, a whole life term would be inappropriate. Mr. Lubanga has been convicted of having committed jointly with others the crimes of conscripting and enlisting children under the age of 15 and using them to participate actively in hostilities in the context of an internal armed, of an internal armed conflict. The Chamber has borne in mind the widespread, the widespread recruitment and the significant use of child soldiers during the time frame of the charges. The position of authority held by Mr. Lubanga within the UPC FPLC and his essential contribution to the common plan that resulted in the ordinary course of events in these crimes against children. The lack of any aggravating circumstances and the mitigation provided by his consistent cooperation with the court during the entirety of these proceedings in circumstances when he was put under considerable unwarranted pressure by the conduct of the prosecution during the trial as just referred to. 
under Article 78.3 of the statute, when the person has been convicted for more than one crime, the court shall pronounce a sentence for each crime and a joint sentence specifying the total period of imprisonment, taking into account all the factors that we have discussed, the majority sentences Mr. Lubanga first for having committed jointly with other persons the crime of conscripting children under the age of 15 into the UPC to 13 years imprisonment, for having committed jointly with other persons the crime of enlisting children under the age of 15 years into the UPC to 12 years imprisonment. And third, for having committed jointly with other persons the crime of using children under the age of 15 to participate actively in hostilities to 14 years imprisonment. Pursuant to Article 78.3 of the statute, the total period of imprisonment on the basis of the joint sentence is 14 years imprisonment. Pursuant to Article 78.2 of the statute, the court shall deduct the time spent in detention in accordance with an order of the court. The court may deduct any time otherwise spent in detention in connection with conduct underlying the crime. Under this provision, the defence submits that the Chamber should deduct the period of Mr Lubanga's house arrest and detention by the DRC authorities between 2003 and 2006. The defence argues that the detention of Mr Lubanga in the DRC was imposed as a result of the same conduct underlying the crimes for which he has been convicted at the court, namely his activities as president of the UPC RP in 2002 to 2003. On this basis, the defence requests that the Chamber deducts this period of domestic detention from Mr Lubanga's sentence. In the judgment of the Chamber, there is insufficient evidence that Mr Lubanga was detained in the DRC for conduct underlying the crimes for which he was convicted at the court, namely the conscription and enlistment of children under the age of 15 and using them to participate actively in hostilities. This contention has not been established on the balance of probabilities, and as a result, the Chamber declines to deduct this period of time from Mr Lubanga's sentence. On the 10th of February 2006, the pre-trial Chamber 1 issued a warrant of arrest against Mr Lubanga, and on the 24th of February 2006, a request for his arrest and surrender was transmitted to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. On the 16th of March 2006, the uh, uh, convicted person was surrendered to the court and transferred to its detention center in the Netherlands. The chamber therefore deducts the time for Mr. Lubanga's surrender on the 16th of March 2006 until the date of, his, of this decision from his sentence. Pursuant to Article 77.2 of the statute and Rule 146.1 of the rules, the Chamber considers it inappropriate to impose a fine in addition to the prison term given the financial situation of Mr. Lubanga. Despite extensive inquiries by the court, no relevant funds have been identified. We add that Judge Odio Benito has written a separate and dissenting opinion on a, dis on a particular and discrete issue. She disagrees with the decision to the extent that, in her view, it disregards the damage caused to the victims and their families, particularly as a result of the harsh punishments and sexual violence suffered by the victims of these crimes pursuant to 145.1c of the rules. In consequence, Judge Odi Benito considers that Mr. Lubanga should be sentenced to an overall term of 15 years imprisonment. 
In accordance with the majority decision, Mr. Lubanga is sentenced to a total period of 14 years imprisonment, from which the time commencing with his surrender to the court on the 16th of March 2006 is to be deducted. We shall rise. All rise, veuillez vous lever.